my name is Matteo Cassese. In my work, I am an entrepreneur. Uh, I help companies do their innovation, do their marketing. And today, all of this has mostly nothing to do with directly what I do. There is no pitch involved, nothing that I'm selling. Uh, and it's really stuff that I'm passionate about, that I've been working on for some time. And these are problems that don't have a direct solution. So I'm not going to give you uh, the, oh, look at these are the problems, but the world of the future will be beautiful. Okay, this set, don't expect the second part. And in particular, um, I want to talk to you uh, about identity, and I think that you will have a special sensibility uh, to identity. Um, who here would define themselves uh, uh, LGBTQI techie? So who is uh, a technologist uh, at heart? Okay, just... Uh, just a few. So maybe you will not be the architects of the future of identity, but I think you can get one major, one major takeaway uh, from, from this talk. Now, I have given something similar in the past, uh, a similar talk to a similar audience, and uh, it might surprise you, there have been uh, other occasions where um, LGBTQI techies have been coming together and, and sharing ideas. And in that occasion, it was three years ago, um, and uh, it was a very small group, it was a very small meetup part of a bigger conference, and I was coming from a place of, let's say, idealism. And this idealism is, is perfectly represented by the gender-bred person. So I was thinking about gender and identity as uh, something that has uh, a lot of nuances. And I was pretty pissed off of the internet because the internet provided me these terrible forms where I had to choose if I was male or female and that was it. I had the gender binary and that was all there was. And I was trying to convince some fellow LGBTQ techies that instead gender is a complex element and it's not made of points, it's made of uh, possibilities on a line, uh, possibilities that go uh, and that are fluid, that can change over time. And I was trying to tell them that the forms that we have on the internet, please come in, um, the forms that we have on the internet that have this name, email, and then the gender as male and female, need to be changed. I was very inspired, I was very passionate about it, I was talking with my heart. And they responded very simply that making that form more complex, making gender, for instance, a, a, a free text where you could write whatever you want, would hurt the conversion rate. Now, at that time, I, I really wasn't ready to hear that, but now I'm ready to tell you that, in fact, coming from a place of idealism and, and hope and um, hope for humanity, it wasn't the right place to be because our world runs by the conversion rate. Downstairs, a few, uh, a few hours ago, there was a talk about optimizing your Facebook presence. And this is what we are doing in this world. We are constantly uh, tweaking and working on, for instance, our social profiles. So I have a question for you. Who of you has a social profile? So at least one Twitter, one Facebook, whatever. So it's maybe, yeah, there's nobody that doesn't have one. So um, let me ask a second question, if you, uh, if you allow me. Who of you has their own picture on any of these profiles? All right, all right. So no um, strange things, no unicorns on, uh, uh, as your profile picture. Right. So third question, who of you is smiling on that picture? <laughs> Come on. The, no. let's, say, let's say three quarters. Let's say over, over the majority. Why do we do that? Why do we do... Why do we look like stock photographs on our social profiles? What are we trying to achieve? Like we are, at least let's, let's talk about me. So I have uh, everything geared towards work. 
So my Twitter, my Facebook is always saying witty things, really smart things. I'm always in cool places where smart people, people smarter than me are speaking and I'm taking notes and I'm reading really long blog posts and articles and I'm sharing the most uh, smart, the ones that make me look, I think, that make me look better. And I have a smiling picture in my, in my profile. And I am curating this, um, this social presence and I, what I'm doing, and I think you're also doing it, um, we're caring very much about what it says about us. It's a big chunk of our identity, especially, especially for the people that don't know us. They are gonna check us out there, so we take some time to choose the profile picture. We, uh, we always reflect, and actually, the act of sharing, which is usually not really a, a conscious uh, process for us, is usually filtered by what does this thing that I'm sharing say about me? What does this thing sh say? Uh, um, how, where, where, where am I in this post? Where am I in this picture of the kittens? Um, where am I in this protest? Where am I in this petition? How does that define me? We are all curating that, I think, in different ways and in different directions. You know, there's the party profile, always drinking, always with a glass. There's a serious profile. There's a professional profile. There's the people that have two different profiles. There's the people who use Facebook like Grindr, the people that use Grindr like Facebook. There's all sorts. But what we are doing is that we're just scratching the surface. And to exemplify this, I'm going to use the uh, eternal iceberg slide. So what we're doing right now is that we are some happy unicorn penguins and then we are just on the tip of the iceberg and then we are there curating a little content and making sure that our identity matches what we really think about ourselves. But actually the real action is happening below the water where we are not seeing it and what I want to talk to you about today is what's happening about our identity that we don't curate, that we probably still don't care enough about. What I'm talking here about is the top part is the curated data, is soft data, is data that it's an opinion, uh, it's data that is a photograph, it's data that you choose the moment to take the photograph, you choose if the photograph gets uploaded or not. The part below the water, and it's the majority of the data that is building our identity right now, and it's building our future identity, is the hard data. It's data that is actually really true. It's my purchases. You know, when I purchase something and I pay a certain amount, that is a hard fact. My location, as it is tracked by mo my mobile device, that is hard data. Um, we are um, buying and wearing devices uh, that track our movements and our body is producing hard data. All of this we can curate. And all of this is the subject of a change in identity that is happening right now. Let's make some examples. So let's go to the title of this talk, Time to Leave for Burkhine. Now, there's a friend of mine and a very dear friend of mine that kind of fell into a habit that he wanted to kick. And this habit involved going to Bergheim. And he decided to detox. And it was a very serious moment for him um, because, you know, there's activities that can, can take a toll, if you know what I mean. And he was making an effort. It was on his first week. He hadn't drunk anything, it didn't go out. It was a Sunday, he was chilling, relaxing. And his phone, his phone has Google Now. Google Now is a fantastic service that mines your data. And it helps you live in a different way. <laughs> there's, there's Google behind the door. <laughs> um, it helps you live your day by collecting data about you. And Precisely at 3 p.m., precisely on the first Sunday of his detox, his phone buzzed in his pocket and said, time to leave Bergheim. 
Now, this is what this technology is meant to do. This is not a malfunction. This is not a bug. It's a feature. When you're trying to detox, your phone that has learned about your behavior, that has learned about your identity, is reminding you who you are. And this is very useful when you are somewhere foreign. If you are a Google Now user, uh, you're gonna have realized that whenever you travel abroad, Google Now recognizes where you're staying, your Airbnb, your hotel, and when it's 3 a.m. and you are drunk and you wanna go home, Google Now tells you the way, the path, the exact path, and it tells you 36 minutes to reach your Airbnb. And it does so automatically. You never input the data. So it's extremely convenient until it's shaping your behavior, it's shaping your identity so much that even though you don't want to be tempted to go to Bergheim, you're trying to do your detox. But then it reminds you, time to go. Now, it's not that Google is particularly evil. Um, Four years ago, Nike launched the Fuel Band, and I was there when they launched it. They made this huge temporary space in Austin. It was all black. It was like the dimension of a soccer field. Inside, there were like only five people, and there was a queue outside of hundreds, and you had this Nike-clad person that was coming to you and inviting you in. It's like, it was like the experience probably buying a Rolls Royce. And, and they showed you the Nike Fuel Band, um, and they personalized it for you so that it would fit your wrist perfectly. Um, and the same day Nike announced, developers, we are gonna give you an SDK, a software developer kit. So you are gonna be able to crack open this Nike Fuel Band, get all access to all the information that's inside of it, and we're gonna do more. Even though you don't wanna hack your single device, we'll give you an API, and through this API, you will be able to access all your data. So buy a Nike Fuel Band today, and from tomorrow, you're going to be able to hack it and get all the data out. Well, Nike never held the promise, and for, for a reason. Um, they're really happy when we still buy uh, some nice shoes, but they are transitioning towards being a software company. And they've they're producing the cash flow with shoes, but actually their platform is our habits and our data. And for no reason will they ever open up the data of, um, of their wearable devices. And this is true for uh, Wii Things, it's true for Fitbit and all of, these, uh, all of these device producers. What they're doing is they're, they're creating siluses. And in these siluses, they are making a, a, a repository of our data. And then they're giving us uh, a small device uh, or an app inside our phones. And with this app, we can have a little glimpse of what's happening to that data. But for instance, Nike will tell you if you are reaching the green, so if you're being good with your objectives. But they're not going to tell you um, you did these steps or um, the activities of your day were this and this and that. They will curate the data for you. They will use an algorithm take the, the, the silo with all your data here, and then extract what is useful uh, in terms of your future behavior, buying a new pair of shoes. Now, it's not like Google and Nike are particularly evil, because this is happening all over the board, and I finally get to mention my favorite company, Apple. Now, Apple has an integrated system that no other company has, it is a full-blown stack, and I'll come to this concept in a second. And most recently, in iOS 8, they launched HealthKit. Who here is a little bit familiar with HealthKit? Uh, all right, it's worth explaining. HealthKit is basically an interface for your health data, for your body data, and it allows you to see this data, to share it, for instance, with the medical world, uh, it is a pretty powerful uh, system, and it integrates with all sorts of devices. And Apple wants to be the hub of your medical identity and your biological heart data coming from your body. And um, Chris Dancy, who's a researcher, uh, who's uh, probably the most connected man on the planet, he has all the possible sensors. His car has sensors, his uh, house has all the sensors, and he does a lot of research in identity. Um, 
he uh, going to the to South by Southwest this year. He, he coined this um, phrase that will probably uh, look good on your Twitter feed. That is, health kit is a new selfie, because you look at yourself inside the phone through your activities. You you see yourself projected in what you do. And so in this sense, it is, it is kind of a selfie. It's kind of a picture of yourself that is given back to you. But Apple did something more uh, just recently. They launched the Apple Watch. And everybody's thinking Apple is entering the watchmaking business. And they are also saying we are entering the watchmaking business. We, uh, got lessons from the Swiss that know how to build watches and we did something better and then there's Johnny Ive talking about the latest polymer that they created and now the glass is curved. This is a huge decoy because if you take an Apple Watch on the face there's this beautiful thing that you can draw a heart and your partner received the heart. I love that. I'd love to get an Apple Watch actually. But on the back it's full of sensors. So actually, you are going to pay up to, I don't know how many thousand dollars, because there's the gold version, to get a fancy health kit sensor. And so, going back to Chris Dancy, if health kit is the new selfie, the iWatch is a new selfie stick. So this is not happening just for these companies. There is what Bruce Sterling calls the stacks. Bruce Sterling is a, um, a science fiction writer, uh, he's a journalist and uh, he's uh, a futurist. And he defines the stacks, these companies like Microsoft, like Apple, like Amazon, that are disrupting um, business in a brand new way by creating a, an equally aligned system of operating systems, of cloud-based services, of um, stores where you can buy stuff and devices that track our data. And they have the sole intention of bringing us into their own silo. And they're going to make it so easy because, no, we don't want to pay one euro for WhatsApp. No, 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 no. That's outrageous. Because then we would be the customers of WhatsApp. We want to have it free and then give away our identity. We don't want to pay for Facebook. We want to be advertised because it's so convenient to have Facebook for free. We are not going to pay for email. We want Gmail completely free because then our data is getting mined and whatever happens and then we get invited to go to Berghain when we are trying to detox. That's what happens. That's what happens today. It doesn't have to be that way. Uh, we have the technologies today to solve all these problems. Instead of the silo that comes from one of these stacks, we have the personal clouds. Personal cloud is a technology that is working already today. We have the open protocols, we have, uh, we have the vendors, we have the systems. It is still complicated to do, but it's there. So we have one way to store our data. At the same time, we have this incredible thing that the computation of these devices is incredibly powerful today. So we have the computation to take that data and to take out meaningful stuff that is going to be useful uh, for us to live our lives better. So we don't have to give up the practicality of Google now. Okay? We, we can just rebuild it with our own systems. The other thing that we are not using from these devices is they have really powerful chips to communicate. And we are using them to communicate with the network, saying Vodafone, for instance, or Telecom. But the, the functionality we are not using is that these devices can create a mesh network. So we could create a network for unit that is working only at this time and where we share all our data completely freely and then shut it down. We could even create a network that works similarly to Snapchat, if you're familiar with that, where you send a message and then after the message is seen, it gets destructed. So you could share 100% of your identity in, in a network that has new rules. And these rules are, for instance, that nobody can store anything. So if you're there in the moment, you can capture it. But if you are not there, and if you are not connected to that network in that instant, you will never have access to that data. But this poses a problem, and that problem is accountability. How do we get uh, accountable identity data? Because you know, that's great if you want to be anonymous, but what if you don't want to? And we have a technology for that. 
It comes from Bitcoin and it is the ledger that is behind and below Bitcoin that is called the blockchain. And the blockchain is quite a complex mechanism, but you have to think that it's, it's, um, it's a ledger that is made through algorithms uh, that have been vetted and it's a transparent way of recording stuff. Right now it's recording transactions uh, connected to a currency, but it could um, connect and uh, validate transactions about our identity. So I want to leave you with a new keyword. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a keyword where there is no SEO being done uh, still. There, it's a keyword uh, and it's a thought that I invite you um, to um, access every time you are either on the receiving end of a form or uh, creating the opportunity to uh, creating your own data. And if you are a technologist, whenever you are on the other side and you're creating uh, these infrastructure, think about identity hygiene. Think about how your data is going to shape the identity of the people that, have, that are going to be part of that. Think about what you are sharing. Think about what you are storing. Remember the iceberg. We are not looking at 90% of, of the data that we are actually producing and that shapes our identity and we are creating that 10%. Try to focus on that. Think about that uh, when you are um, out there creating content. Think about that when you are um, getting some new, uh, some new devices. Sometimes you don't even need to get the device to get uh, the data, to get, your, to get tracked. It, you just need to rent a car to go uh, and, uh, um, or, or um, use any of the online services to actually start building on that, um, on that amount of data. So think about identity hygiene. This is what I had time um, for, uh, for you today. And I'd really like to uh, hear what you think about this. And if you feel a little bit shy, think about me that I've made a fool of myself for the last 20 minutes. So don't be, don't be shy.